Hello, my name is Jeff. Thank you for watching. In this video, I'm going to talk about threads. I'm going to talk about GUIs. I'm going to talk about why threads come up in the context of a GUI and some of the issues that surround the multi-threaded GUIs. As you can see, we're doing this in Java with Java threads and the Swing toolkit. So if you're running a different toolkit, some of this is not going to apply to you. Over on the right-hand side of the screen, I've got a simple Java GUI written in Swing couple of buttons, a uh, couple of text fields, uh, and this will be enough to show what happens when you have one button does something quickly and one button does something slowly, uh, the situation where you might want to introduce threads. I'm uh, going to walk through the code really quickly just to uh, get it out of the way. We have a class threading GUI demo which extends JFrame. That's not the only way to do it. Uh, I usually prefer to think of my GUI containing a frame rather than my GUI being a frame, but this is uh, easier for demonstration purposes. Um, Superclass constructor uh, sets the title of the frame. Default close operation makes it so that the close button up here does what you'd expect. Set size, this is just the size that works for me. Set location, not typically used in a GUI. Again, just for the purposes of this video, I want my GUI to show up in the same place on the screen every time in a place that's convenient for the screen capturing software that I'm doing right now. Uh, then we have a border around the root pane and a 2x2 two two grid with a border in between the rows and columns. Uh, four lines of code to create the four components. Four lines of code. Let me scroll this down a little bit. Four lines of code to add them to the GUI and a simple little main program that instantiates the GUI and makes it visible. If I run that, it takes a couple seconds to compile and there we go. I can click on these uh, and they change color to indicate that they're clicked but they don't actually do anything because I don't have any event handlers. I don't have any uh, action listeners yet. So let's set that aside and move on to the interesting part. Uh, this, will be the, this will be the file where I put all of my event handlers and action listeners. This is where the code is going to be that actually does something. Right now I haven't written any code. So I've got a class that uh, has creates a thread demo GUI, stores a reference to it, and uh, I've got a main method that creates that application and calls set visible. So we rerun that. Same thing, right? Still doesn't do anything. So now let's make it so the color button does something. That's cool, but it doesn't do anything if I click it again because it's already green, so let's make it toggle. Okay, that's pretty good. So that button does a quick color change. Let's make the other button do something that takes a while. Okay, that's pretty close. Let me just go clean up a couple of things here. Okay, now we can run this and see what it does. This button still toggles the color. This button should have printed, please wait. 
and during the 10 seconds that it takes to run, this button doesn't work. Not only that, run it again, if I click that button, it takes 10 seconds, this button doesn't even work. But if we wait the 10 seconds, Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, actually, let me bring that back up again. So up in the swing library, there's a piece of code called the event loop. The event loop is just an infinite loop that waits for the operating system to tell it that there's been a keyboard uh, key press or a mouse click or something. And when that happens, it looks at the JFrame, which gets some help from the content pane, which gets some help from the layout manager. And between them, they figure out that the mouse click, for example, took place uh, while the mouse was hovering over the color button. So then one of them calls the color button and calls and uh, tells it, hey, this event happened. The color button looks to see if it has any action listeners on it. It does because I added one here. So then the color button calls the action perform method on that, on that object, which calls change color, which finally gets into some code that I care about. Change color decides to which color it is, changes the color to either pink or green. Uh, and this happens very quickly, right? We're talking uh, a fraction of a second, faster than a millisecond. You know, if we wanted to measure this, we'd have to measure it in nanoseconds, right? So then we come down to this closing curly brace at the end of change color. That's an implied return. So it comes back here to the end of action performed, another curly brace. That's an implied return. Return, return, return. Everybody goes back up um, to the event to the event loop which uh, is happy with this and goes back up to the top of the loop and starts waiting for the operating system to tell it uh, about the next key press or mouse click. So then the next one happens, and this time it's over the compute button. And the compute button says the uh, same thing happens. It winds up here in the action listener. Action perform calls compute. Compute calls the set text, which, uh, interesting side note, didn't seem to do anything. Then the next thing that happens is third dot sleep. The argument here is in milliseconds, so 10 times a thousand, a millisecond is a thousandth of a second, so 10 times a thousand is 10 seconds. And during that 10 seconds, not much happens. Uh, the event loop is stuck waiting, right? It's, it's just hanging around wondering what's going on. Actually, it's not wondering what's going on because it's not executing, right? It called a function that has not returned yet, so it's just stuck. Uh, And during that time, um, any event that comes in from the operating system, any other button clicks just aren't going anywhere. So during that 10 seconds, the operating system tells us, well, we're, we, we've got some more button clicks going on, but the event loop isn't running, so it can't process them. And so, from the user's point of view, the, the, U, the, the UI seems to be unresponsive because there's this long-running operation happening uh, essentially in the same code that's supposed to be processing events. So the solution to this is to add another thread. Now a thread, first of all I need a variable name, the usual variable name is T. A thread is a thread of execution. It means that we can have more than one uh, we can have the, the processor running more than one piece of our code at the same time. Each one is its own thread of execution. Now, there's more than one way to set this up, but the easiest is to have threading demo implement a class called runnable. Runnable is an interface that requires one method called run. Run just represents some chunk of code that I want to run later. And the chunk of code I'm going to run later is the body of the compute method. And to create a new thread, all we have to do is say t equals new thread. And that should work. Notice that I can click on the color button, it changes color even while the compute is running.
So now I'm going to scroll down a little bit. We can look at the code I just wrote in a little more detail. So the event loop called the compute button is actually the compute button. The compute button called action performed. Action performed called compute. Compute called set text on please wait, which we actually got to see this time. That's a pretty fast operation. Then it created a new thread. That's a pretty fast operation. Then it called t.start, which surprisingly is a fast operation because what t.start does is it tells the thread to start itself, but it doesn't wait around for it to finish. So this function returns right away. We get to the end of the method, curly brace, that's a return. Compute goes back to here, curly brace, that's a return, and we return back up to the event loop. The event loop starts re uh, spinning through its event loop again. Meanwhile, because of the t.start, this thread is now running this run method because I passed in this object, which is a runnable. The run method is going to simulate this time consuming operation by calling sleep. And when it's done with the sleep, it's going to say set text, the answer is 42. We also have this interrupted exception here, which I threw in just because sleep is declared as throwing an interruption exception. So I had to throw, I had to surround the thing with a try catch block. But let's talk about what the interrupted exception is actually for. There's another cool thing we can do here, and that's we can give the user the ability to cancel the long running computation without waiting for it to finish. Okay, so now I've changed it so that with, when I click compute, um, the label on that button says compute. So it's not equal to cancel. So it doesn't do this if. It comes down to the else. It sets the text to please wait just like it did before. But then it changes the button label uh, to cancel. And then it does the thread and the start like it did before. So if I push this button a second time, the second time through it will be equal to cancel. Uh, it'll set the field um, for the compute field. It'll set the text to empty string change the label on the compute button back to compute, and assuming the thread is there, it interrupts it. If somehow we've gotten into this and we haven't created that thread yet, that's okay. There's nothing to interrupt. We can still just set the answer to the empty string and set the but button label back to compute. From the user's point of view, that'll be fine. When we call t.interrupt, scroll up, that causes uh, thread.sleep to stop executing. It hits an interrupted exception. So these next two lines, the answer is 42, and setting the button back to compute don't happen. Instead, we go into the catch block for the interrupted exception. Now, the only way we can get to this catch block for the interrupted exception is if the user has clicked the cancel button that caused us to make it interrupt itself. So since this other part of the code wants us to go away, the simplest thing for us to do is to just go away quietly. So I took away the error message that used to be here. So now let's see how that works. I'm going to scroll down. Hopefully we can get all the code in the view at the same time. Uh, a little bit higher, right there. OK. Run it. Takes a minute to compile it. OK. So the label says compute. If I click it, it says please wait. The label changes the cancel. Click that. Zeroes out the field, changes back to compute. And I can click this anytime I want to. If I wait for it, the label goes back to the answer is 42, and the button goes back to compute. Wait for it, wait for it. There it is. So that's why you would want to have multi-threading in a GUI application. But now let's talk about some of the problems that it can cause. Uh, we've got this thing here. It says uh, when the run is done, it's going to do set text on the compute field to say the answer is 42. And it's going to do set text on the compute button to set it back to compute. But what if the user hits the cancel button at exactly the same time that this long running operation is done and the, and the thread.sleep returns, OK? Then what's going to happen is, in the compute method, this if statement is going to say, is it equal to cancel? Yes, it is. And so then it moves on to the next line and says, set text empty string. At the same time, this code up here is going to be setting the compute button to compute. So you can see where this is sometimes a potential problem, right? This code made a decision 
based on what it was thought to be true. And on the very next line, it's not true anymore. This is a source of, this can be a source of bugs. This can be uh, hard to debug because it's hard to reason about what's going on. If you can't trust that an if condition is still true one line later, it's hard to know what you can trust and what you know, is going on in the code. Plus which we have a what's called a race condition where either the compute button is uh, sorry either the compute field is going to wind up saying 42 or the compute field is going to wind up empty depending on which of the two threads uh, ran first and which of the two threads ran second. This is called a race condition because the output of the program depends on which of the two threads wins the race. Uh, and generally that's bad because it means you have a program that's uh, the output is unpredictable. Even when there's no human involved, uh, you can have a situation where uh, two threads, usually one of them is faster than the other one, but sometimes it's possible for one of them to be scheduled on a, you know, let's say you have a multi-core CPU, one of them gets scheduled on a core that's recently overheated and is throttled down so it's running slower, or the uh, operating system isn't balancing the load among your CPUs as well as it could, and so one of the CPUs is more heavily loaded. So even if the, th the two threads are running at the same time on different cores of the same CPU, it's not always going to be predictable which one finishes first. And now we throw a user into the mix, and the user sees this message that says, please wait, they're going to be patient, but exactly how long are they going to be patient? It's not going to be the same from day to day. In this case, it's maybe not so bad because the user did click the compute button a while ago, meaning they're okay with having this com computation running. They also did click the cancel button, or thought they did, so they're okay with the computation not running. Uh, at the end, either, oops, either the answer gets shown or an empty string gets shown, um, and they should be okay with either outcome. The compute button gets set back to the word compute either way. So it's, it's not that bad. I think in this situation, I'd be willing to live with it. If I wasn't willing to live with it, I would probably uh, think to what's going on at the user interface design level because really the worst case scenario here is that the button says cancel, the user moves to click the cancel button, and right before they click the mouse, the computation gets done and the cancel button changes to a compute button, and so the answer gets wiped and the computation starts running all over again. Uh, but that's not a race condition. That's a problem with the UI design, um, the fact that it's sharing, where to it go? Sharing this one button for both things and having the label on the button change. Maybe not the best design, right? Uh, if the cancel button was a separate button, uh, I would probably want to change the UI design first to make the cancel button a separate button before trying to fix the code to make this uh, strange UI design work. But even if I'm willing to live with it as far as this code is concerned, uh, that is, I don't think that this code is going to be too badly upset. What about the set text method on the field, right? Um, how's that set? How's that set text method implemented? How is that code going to cope with having two different threads calling the same set text method with different text at exactly the same time, right? Um, you got to assume that it, the string that's being passed in as an argument is being copied somewhere. You got to assume there's some sort of font renderer involved to try to draw what that text looks like on the screen. Um, is it going to cope, right? And the general rule in Swing is no. Uh, the sw the rule in Swing is that you should assume that methods are not thread safe uh, unless noted otherwise, because trying to make everything thread safe is uh, going to both make the application sluggish and prone to other problems. So uh, the general rule is you shouldn't do that. Traditionally, though, set text is an exception to the rule. Um, set text for many years was documented as being thread safe. And so you see a lot of code that calls set text from multiple threads just because it's sort of unuseful to have a you know separate thread do something that takes a while and then call set text to inform the UI that it's done. Uh, if you're going to do any more than set text, you do need to, uh, like if I wanted to change a color or something, that's not going to be thread safe. Uh, you have to use some other facilities, which I'm not going to talk about in this video, but uh, things like uh, swing utilities that invoke later or the swing worker class um, uh, in, order to, uh, in order to root this change so that this is happening uh, on the proper thread. There have also been bugs reported against set text over the years with people uh, writing a bug report saying, hey, this 
method is supposed to be thread safe, but it's not thread safe in this case. So I mean, the end of the at the end of the day, the answer is is it thread safe? Maybe. And if you can't live with it, you should look up um, Invoke Later or look up Swing Worker. The uh, Oracle documentation for those two things kind of assumes that you already understand the, the basic issues that I was talking about in this video. So I hope uh, that I at least I've given you uh, understanding of the general situation. Uh, if you liked this video, that's great. If you disliked this video, be sure to click the dislike button and leave a nasty comment down below. Uh, that's all I've got for you, and thank you for watching. Bye-bye.